Welcome to the Path Podcast. It's May 19th, 2024. My name's Tony. I'm here with Ock. Hey, Tony. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, this is an unusual recording time for us. It's a little different for us. It is. Got up at 5.30 this morning to come record before the shop opens because we have scheduling needs. Yep. And um, that's half hour after my normal my normal wake time. Yeah. And there's nothing like good or bad necessarily about waking up early. Everyone has their, their normal wake up time. Maybe I, mean, I think it's sort of associated with virtue to wake up early. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe there's a band of virtue of early waking up, you know, like is noon okay to wake up? <laughs> but, well, I I think also there are people who probably hold virtue in, in being that that night person too. Mm, right, 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 right. I thought it so I came in this morning a little groggy and I thanks for pointing out that I had an extra long wizard nose hair. <laughs> oh man, my pleasure. So it's I went gone. in the bathroom and I take care of it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Dude. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. No joke. No joke. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> okay, so I so since I have a my shave my head, I actually shave my head with a manual razor, but I have an electric one that I bought and it came with an actual nose hair trimmer. Oh nice. It. That thing is awesome. That's cool. Yeah, I have that same thing and my my ears too. Uh but uh yeah, so normal early wake up time. My normal early wake up time is, is five, and there's really no later or no earlier. Yeah, I get up at six thirty two days a week and I sleep till I wake up mm. five days a week, which usually means about seven. Okay. Yeah, see that's um but do you notice that uh once you get earlier than your normal than your normal early, it really ramps up how groggy you feel and how hard it is. Yeah, it's like a vague reminder of what it was like to be the parent of a of a like oh toddler or a baby. Right, like the three o'clock or the two o'clock, <laughs> yeah. and you're what? Where? What? <laughs> yeah, I notice like waking up at five is is totally fine with me, and then ease into the day. But if I have to wake up at four forty five. That just feels super early to me, and it's only fifteen minutes. So, yeah. So, anyways, that's uh, my normal early versus really early. So, so how are things going at the shop? It's an interesting time at the shop. It's so it's the time of year where things pick up for sure, and we're we're busy. We're booked out a couple of weeks on service right now. Which, and that's with here and here at the 649 B Street location in Tustin lately. If you go in our workshop, there are five, five techs working who I would be absolutely thrilled to have any one of them working on my bike mm. all, all day, plus a service manager, man, what, control, you know, keeping the whole situation from going too far off the rails. Right. Um, so that's a lot of repairs that we're doing and a lot of service and, and we're still booked out. Yeah, I, I saw that. I got to witness it yesterday because I had to bring I had to bring my bike in um, for to just to have checked out. Uh, and uh, yeah, I got the whole experience. I walked it in at six forty nine B. I walked it in the front door, and and we've talked about on the show how the flow uh, through the shop uh, is better for for service and for many things, but specifically for service in this context. And it really is walk in the front door, walk to the, you know, past the, the front desk and then the bike can get wheeled right back to the, to the shop. And then when it's ready for pickup, it comes right out. Correct. I think waiting, I think it usually took us probably on average, like five to 10 minutes to go get your repair bike mm, right. at first street. And I think now on average, I think that's about one minute. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's what I was noticing. I really like the way the back is laid out. Um, you can, you don't even have to roll the bike through the work, through the middle of the, uh, the, the, the work area. So you just actually by design, you probably don't. I do mean, that. you would think that that would be almost a, a, I think most people, if you ask them, like, do you think that anyone would put a trap, put a traffic pathway through a workshop? They would be like, no, that's not a good idea. Right. But uh, due to t space, spatial limitations at the old shop, that was just a reality of life for us. Right. And so that was actually, I always felt a little bit like I was letting the crew down as 
in allowing it to mm. be that it just it's inefficient and I could see it right, right. and right so that was for sure from the beginning a big kind of goal for this shop is right. to not have traffic move through the workshop and right. to have traffic ways around the workshop it's pretty wild we 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 are our, our service area stores about 80 repair bikes okay right and you know it sounds like a lot but it's really like two to three days of work for us. Oh, wow. Maybe four days of work. Wow. So, and and right. if you consider that at any given time, somewhere around half the bikes are waiting for pickup, it might really be two days of work for us. Right, right. Of, of as far as storage for bikes that we're, are ready to work on. Yeah, I noticed. I really like in the back area, also the proximity of the repair bikes to the work area. Right. So the, the mechanics, when they need to pick up or, or, you know, put back is super close. Again, I think a, a lot of listeners might be just like, well, of why course. would it not be? Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason it would not be is because of a weird evolution of taking over a building one suite at a time and having to make it work. Yeah. I guess it's a, it's an, we could probably talk about this more, an evolution of a bike club into a bike shop Yeah, and growing. You, you can't from that immediately jump into a space this large. Right. And so we started off in 500 feet. This is 6,000 feet and we're still operate. We still occupy 4,000 feet down the road too. Right. I think this is a good time to point out though, that the best way to work with the path to have service is to, I think the ideal situation is you text us at 714-669-0784 or off the web chat on our website. Right. And just say, Hey, I have this bike. I need service. This is what I think it needs. We'll get back to you with a service date and you can bring it in, say that week mm. or that, you know, a few days before that, that way we can do our inspection, give you our estimates or make sure we have the parts lined up. When you text us, we might ask you for like a picture. Say you're going to get a fork service. We might ask you for a picture of the serial number of the fork so that we can make sure we have the right seal kit for it in stock. That Got kind of it. Thing. No, that's a really good, that's a really good use of, of the text and the chat and, and a new, and the a business process. And I, we call it an appointment, but I think that can some pe for sometimes that can be a little misleading because an appointment I think makes me think, oh, I'm going to show up and it's going to happen right then mm -hmm. while I wait, like it's an hour appointment maybe or a two hour appointment. And what we really mean is that you're scheduled for service on that day. Right. We'll almost for sure start it and complete it on that day. So um, that's why you say a few days beforehand, either make sure that you've kind of coordinated what might be happening. Right. I think a more specific way, I think a more specific way to say it is schedule a service date and you don't need to drop your equipment off to schedule your service date. Right. And if your equipment is rideable, especially, well, for us, we just can't store it for a week or two. Right. We don't have room. Right. Um, but also if it's rideable, that means that you can be in line for service and still be getting some rides in. Yeah. And by, by calling ahead, scheduling ahead, you really help make sure that again, like you said, the shop has the parts, you guys can order the parts. If you don't have them, uh, you get to ride your bike. And then when you come in, everything's set up and help yep. to ensure the bike's done the day that you think it's going to be done. Other news around, I thought it was really interesting. Giant increased a bunch of bike prices, like almost all their bike prices. Whoa. In this day and age, in this time. It's a very unusual. Like most prices are going to have the last two years, the trend in the industry is price reductions. Right. And sales and discounts. And so all the bikes that we've been selling a lot of like trans models on sale. Right. For example, we have the trans X29 two and the trans two. We've had those on sale for 1995 since October. Right. And then we've been, I mean, I think we sold, we sold a lot of them. Right. Um, and those are now 20, now we're selling them for 2150 giant, mm -hmm. giant increased our price. So we have to increase the price on them. Right. And so this is 2024 bikes. They increased their in season pricing on 2024 bikes, mm -hmm. which part of this is they're starting to sell out. Right. Um, uh, and they, in a bunch of their clearance bikes that they've had for a while, they increased all the prices on those too. Um, I so. wonder, it's interesting. I read an article in brain 
uh, bike real retailer in industry news, um, saying that uh, a lot of sectors of giant are still slow, but uh, I guess in China they're um, they're really uh, growing. Interesting. So I wonder how that relates. I I think we are experiencing that kind of price stab st stabilization right. for the most part. Right. We're still going to see some wild sales on some stuff this summer, but it's not going to be as across the board. Got it. For example, one of our big brands is going to release a new model later in the summer. Got it. And that model is going to be 30% off maybe later in the summer. Wow. But it's what some of these brands last summer, their whole line went 20 to 30% sure, off. And, sure. and I, I don't think the discounts are going to be as aggressive this summer from, from what I'm seeing in early, in early discussions with our vendors of what their plans are. Right. So as far as you know, yeah, there's going to be some bikes that some brands, a lot of our brands went really, really um, light on their 2024 bike orders. Sure. And they've got a few and they sold out. And they still have some 23s and 22s that they need to work through. But they didn't have to put their 24s on sale. They sold out before they went on sale in yeah. a lot of cases. I think that's kind of the trend. Right. And it's, you know, if you just keep getting stuck with stuff, it's like, Try ordering a thousand. Okay, that was too many. Try ordering a hundred. Okay, let's tr let's order eight. Right, oh, like, <laughs> like <laughs> and I think um, then you grow from there. You find a healthy baseline, right, where you can get what it costs to make stuff and get it here, and then um, grow from there. And right. I think that's where a lot of the industry is right now. Twenty twenty four was that testing of the of the other bookend, the low side of the bookend. Yeah, I think that a lot. And the other thing about that is bike brands are just like any other entity you have to pay your bills before you can pay, do more mm, yeah. so if you have thousands of 2023 bikes on there, the books there's a lot of bills you have to pay on that you can't get thousands more without getting um, a cash flow infusion or right. and at that point you don't look like a good investment for a cash flow infusion right right so um I think a lot of the industry is still working through the overstock, but also not trying to add to it and still trying to innovate and finding that balance, right? Sure. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, um, are you seeing like, are you seeing indicators of the market coming back on, uh, at the retail level? Not to jinx any, any I mean, positivity. The shop, the shop has been, busy the last the, this year the shot the, the general trend has been upwards for sales mm -hmm. still way below our our busiest years and still kind of just fighting for survival but moving in the right direction right right and the last couple of weeks have been kind of pretty pretty good as far as a lot a lot, a lot of people are buying bikes right now right. i think a lot of people are realizing that the hot new 2024 model they want is actually going to sell out and not go on sale mm, or, sure. or act, maybe the one they wanted already sold out. And they're like, Oh, I don't want the, my second choice to sell out too, you know? <laughs> sure. Um, or they're realizing that that bike that they've been watching go down in price is, and have been is waiting now for, actually ticked up or, or yeah. at least it's been the same price for a while now. And mm. some of them are ticking up and most of them haven't gone down much. Right. In, or, or well in the case of us and giant we've had the lowest price on a lot of trans models on the internet for a while since like october right and that price hasn't changed right yeah yeah until now and it's gone up right yeah that'll be interesting to well this is i guess cautiously optimistic um you know hopefully hopefully the the positive trend continues for the whole industry I think more and more people our age are realizing that e-bikes don't make them look old. <laughs> right. I keep, it's every single day in the shop, someone comes in and they're like, I really want an e-bike, but I'm not old enough yet. And it's usually someone like it, roughly our age or a little older. Right. Um, so in other words, born in the early 70s or late 60s. Sure. Um, or even mid 70s, maybe. And 
I always like try to gently explain to him like, yeah, a lot of my friends who are about my age see the e-bike like a walker or like a <laughs> prosthetic, you know, yeah. like a, yeah. like a, a crutch. Right. And I was like, kind of makes you look old to think that because <laughs> the younger riders don't see it that way at all. Right. Right. Um, Man, it's all, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I had an interest along those lines. Uh, for, for many years, <clears throat> friends and acquaintances, I know when they're getting into biking, mountain biking, they would ask me, Hey, so, you know, can you help me look for a bike? And they always mean like muscle bike. Yeah. Uh, just recently a friend of mine, you know, I keep in touch with him and text me, Hey, Ock, can you help me find an e-mountain bike? And this is his first bike. Yeah. He's about my, he's, he's about our age, you know? And so it's interesting to see starting a shift, even people getting into it. Yeah. People of our age. Yeah. Yeah. Another aspect of the shift is, you know, we do these shop rides and we've done some e-bike shop rides, right. like two or three, if that. Most of the bike rides we do are just rides. Right. And mostly for the most part, Almost no e-bikers show up. Mm. Only muscle bikers or, show up on the changing? shop rides. Yesterday we did our Saturday sunset ride with some snacks and refreshments after at mm -hmm. Lossy at, at Irvine Park. Got it. And more than half of the people who showed up out of nowhere were on e-bikes. Oh. And, and all of the new faces were on e-bikes. Wow. And we didn't say anything different. You didn't say like. We this positioned it as like a very open ride. Right. Maybe, maybe that was the difference. Right. Um, but we didn't mention e-bikes at all. But I think that's a shift too, is like you just say you're having a bike ride and some e-bikers might show up. Yeah. Which is also kind of different. Yeah. And not like, hey, is this an e-bike friendly ride? Like they just show up. They like, show I'm all, up. Kind of interesting. Yeah, you and I were riding the other day, and we passed, um, you know, we passed, we we crossed paths with many many people. I think it's interesting how uh, we're on e-bikes, and we passed uh, a couple of younger guys, Troy Lee. Troy Lee. <laughs> we passed some celebrities on. Celebrities. We can name drop a little. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Hans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That we, group definitely, we, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh uh Brett Tippy. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Gosh, that, that was awesome. <laughs> so uh but the, the we also have some younger writers, like much younger writers. Yep. And I think what was interesting is there's no like sideways glances at the e bikes. I would say you have to be very keen on knowing where to look and how to look to even tell the bikes mm. we were riding were e-bikes too, though. That's true. Because we're all pretty much on Fazua bikes that have right. completely hidden motors and discrete ring controllers. And really, if you know where to look for the LED lights of the Fazua system, then, then it's you, a quick check. Right. But if you don't, you're like searching the bike. Yeah. Like, yeah, we were just looking, you know, a former guest on the show, Eric, um, <clears throat> was in the shop and I came in as well and I was looking at the 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 nomad that was hanging and with the you know beefier beefier uh, uh frame and then the in frame storage holy moly it looks like an e-bike frame hanging in the shop people ask me every single day if a Santa Cruz not e-bike is an e-bike yeah pretty much in the shop yeah 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 and so because you were riding a uh, Heckler SL mm -hmm. on a recent ride. Yep. Uh, what was that like? <laughs> Pretty awesome. <laughs> I kind of want one. <laughs> um, so I've been riding my... I, I used that bike for a ride that I had, had been recently riding, a Relay PNW Coil 170-170 yep. with Zip Moto wheels, and Kush Core Pro inserts yep. and all my stuff, TRP so, brakes, like very. Even though it's an SL bike, it's. There's a. <clears throat> well, I, what I would say is it's an SL big hit enduro bike. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why it gets to be 
37 ish pounds, 36 or I'm 47, sorry, 46, right. 47 pounds right. and still called an SL. Right. Because it's a big enduro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that is light for it. That is. Big enduro. I mean, that's, that is very light. That's especially easily for that 10, style. that's 10 pounds lighter than a crest line big enduro. Like right, for sure. Which, so, and by the time you put the cush core and the crest line and everything else, it's even more. Yeah. It's probably apples for apples, 12 pounds lighter than a yeah. big, big. Like those, those, with, yeah. A giant a E-Rain or something like that with, yeah. Well, an E-Rain doesn't even come in aluminum and those are heavy. It's pro- Apples for apples, it's probably 15 pounds lighter than an E-Rain. Mm-hmm. An E-Rain before the cush core is almost 60. Right. Holy it, moly. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, yeah, so you're, uh, yeah, that's what we've been riding. I, I ride that, that, trans- that relay I, full enduro SL and it's 47. And then, but you were on the heck. One of the things SL. I like about that bike is it really makes me feel confident. Like I will ride stuff conf- with, like without, with, with disregard and, and kind of dis right. Like I will, I will approach sections with, um, kind of disregard for the section that on other sections I'd be kind of like picking my way through or like really setting up my line or yeah. like maybe, um, yeah, there's a couple and even new, new, uh, techie aggressive sections of trail segments of trail. I look at those and I'm like, okay, I think I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing. And then on other bikes, when I would do that and, you know, make it through, you're like, okay, expectation met the, you know, the reality. Uh, and on this, on the relays right now, the Char- charge it and it'll work out. Like. Exactly. <laughs> the expectation is not meeting the reality because it's so much easier. Yeah. So that was kind of the, that was kind of the, the, the workload or the duty that the, I feel yeah. like the, the heckler SL got um, put, put into. Through. Yeah. And side note, it's cause I'm getting a ba- uh, motor warranty and I'll, I want to circle back on okay. it a little bit. Okay. Um, that's only part of why I also wanted, I think I could have ridden my bike. My bike wasn't disabled. It just had a little click in it and a little play. Right. Um, so get on the bike first run. I feel like I rode it the same way I would have ridden it on my relay without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Just like I just felt right. Right. And even though you made a wrong turn. I did make a wrong turn. That's <laughs> okay. Um, it, it, which kind of it surprised me how how well the bike handled chunk mm. and speed and how stable it was in turns and transition from turn to turn and chunky turns and fast turns. Right. And, um, it manuals amazingly mm. well. It's got um, the shorter, shorter, um, chain stays a little bit. I think I wouldn't be surprised. You know, you ever notice Santa Cruz bikes all have this huge overlap in the Venn diagram of how they ride. Yeah. They're like Santa Cruz has a ride quality mm, and yeah. a lot of brands do. I would say pivot has a ride quality. Santa right. Cruz has, I would say those two brands ride qualities have been kind of moving towards each other right. a little bit over the years. Right. Um, but still, if you've ridden a lot of Santa Cruz bikes, you get on a Santa Cruz bike, and the cat, you just kind of know what's going to yeah. happen. Whether it be a tall boy or a high tower, uh, even Nomad, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So the Heckler I saw, I think it's a 150, 160 bike. Yep. And mixed wheel and light, quite a bit lighter than my relay. I think the one I was riding was probably 42 pounds or something. Yeah. Crazy. Um, yeah. Um the lyric with the buttercups that was my first time riding oh, that right. fork yeah with, so good so I, good i agree i was not just impressed i was surprised that i didn't miss the cush core more yeah okay which i think is a testament to the bike and to the reserve wheels being pretty good sure. and just a lot of things are work just work on that bike right um i'd like to try it with cush core yeah i think it's interesting too is that the lyric is a th- the stanchions are 35 millimeters. Right. So those are the quote, smallest stanchions you've ridden in a while. I mean, compared to the 36 and the 38, I've got a 38 on my relay, 36 on my switchblade. Yeah. So hopping over to the, the, the lyric and I, I find that too. I have, I have a lyric on my, on my muscle bike, my trans X, uh, muscle bike. And I, I don't miss the 36. I think 
you know, it's important to consider that stanchion diameter is only one aspect of mm, fork stiffness. Sure, sure. And that a millimeter is a millimeter. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a decent percentage of the overall yeah, but somewhat right. decent percentage. Um, wall right. thickness goes into it yep. and Crown, then other kind of structural you know, engineering yep. goes yep. into it too and materials and sure. all that. Sure. Um, seems stiff enough for that travel range for me. Yeah. Um, didn't quite. And on an e-bike. That's true. And on an e-bike. Yes. You know, probably almost, nah, it's 15 pounds heavier. Yeah. 15 pounds heavier than my. If, if you had asked me probably a month ago, what I would have noticed between those two bikes, I would have probably guessed Kush core tra- and coil. Yeah. And, and, um, high speed stability and sure. big hit stability. Sure. And I think I did know what I, what I ended up mostly noticing between them was brakes. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, um, jumping. Okay. Especially smaller jumps. Like, mm-hmm. you know, some of those trails have like yeah. little, like two foot, do- two foot tall doubles, yeah. like just little hits that get you over something I had this experience and onto yesterday. a transition. Yeah. And the relay thinks they're bumps. The relay, <laughs> the relay just <laughs> tries to erase them. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you do the little pre, you know, the, the pre jump thing on those and the move just feels like it's, it's, it's a bump. Yeah. It yeah. eats, it eats the lip up. Yeah. Yeah. I had this, I had a similar, uh, you know, I have my trance and that's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's overstroked. So it's probably very similar, uh, geometry to the, to the Heckler SL. And yesterday I wrote it for the first time in a while. Uh, I was, yeah, first time in a while. And I had that same thing. I was like, uh, you know, pre jumping these little, little two foot. I was like, Whoa, that actually felt like, I yeah. like jumping. You know, yeah. instead of, cause I've been riding the relay quite a bit, uh, and I was thinking, man, is there space in, in life for, for two e-bikes that look like this, the, the difference between a Heckler SL and a relay 150, 160 versus 170, 180, you know, like. I really think we're moving into a world where people who bu- have quivers of bikes have two e-bikes. Well, multiple e-bikes. Maybe have the same quiver of e-bikes if mm-hmm. if they have the space and the money. Yeah. If you're going to have say, um, kind of like a 150-ish travel lighter weight kind of all mountain bike yep. and a big enduro bike. Yep. You might have if that's your muscle bike setup. You might also have those two categories covered on e-bikes. If- yeah. Yeah, and it seemed like the industry is is moving that direction too. I was just looking at the 2025 rise, Orbea rise, um, complete redesign, right? Uh, and six on the in the low setting, low slack, it's 64 degree head angle. I think, I think it's got a 460 reach as well. So, and this is medium. So that's, uh, that's pretty long. And we talked about, you know, having a longer reach, like on the, um, on your pivot, uh, switchblade, switchblade, which I think is 468 in low. Yeah. So that's, seems like things are moving longer. Yeah. I don't think to me, but helpful. I would say a year ago as a me as a medium bike rider i considered 460 on the long side and i yep. think for me right now as a medium bike rider i consider it on the short side yeah but i don't know how many of the companies their mediums are really longer than 460 i mean i know pivot is at 468 but i think kind of 460 is maybe mid. i think a lot of companies haven't come out with anything new lately mm, that's true that's true they, and they, i think when, when you look at bikes that have been um like a fresh mold Right. In the last year or two. Right. I think you see a little mm, bit different yeah, story. I see, I see. Yeah. What's interesting too, talking on this kind of, uh, SL, I don't know what you want to call that. 150, 160. Is that a trail bike? <laughs> all mountain. All mountain. Uh, I didn't used to understand the term all mountain because, and I think the problem was back when, before the Fox 38 and before the Zeb. Yep. It was kind of the same forks with different travel. Yeah. yeah. 
and I just didn't understand how one, how like a bike with two bikes with a Fox 36 were one was an enduro bike and one was an all mountain bike and what the difference really was in people's minds. Right. But now the enduro bikes weigh 36 pounds. Right. And I see how there's such a thing as a 31 pound all mountain bike. Sure. Yeah. Um, but what I was going to say on the rise, I don't know if you noticed this, the new 2025 rise has two settings, has two tunes for the motors that EP eight, uh, Oh one. Uh, it's the, it's the newer generation, obviously two tunes, you know, on the older rise, you could, it was detuned to 60 or 65, 60, 60, uh, on the new rise, you can either ride it at 60 or at, Mm -hmm. at 65 or 60 or 85. True. Which is awesome. Yeah. Full power, lightweight. It's full power, lightweight. The second, the second bike in the category. Exactly. Or, uh, or reduced power, uh, longer range. Right. I mean, most of these bikes can be remapped to a reduced power if you want, Mm. if you use the apps. Right. Can you, I guess so. So what it would do is just remap, but, uh, but Orbea's had this specific mapping only for the rise and now they've the RS mapping, which is 60 newton meters. Yep. And now they've opened it up to the more standard mapping. I wonder what that does for the efficiency. I wonder if the EP801 is more efficient at full power. I bet you maybe it is. Maybe the EP801 is more power. I'm pro sciencing. Uh, more efficient at full power. And then, uh, which is why when we ride, maybe why, when we ride with, with Eric, this is going back. I think there's the underlying question of does the battery put out a, st- a steady amount of energy that the motor then op- utilizes an amount of, or does the motor or does the battery put out energy more on demand as the controller tells it, or what the system like draws from it, right? Because if the battery puts out just the, th- what's demanded of it by the system, then I don't see how it would be more efficient at a higher power. But I do know electric motors, depending if you run them at like their their design point, mm-hmm. are percentage of, percentage points more efficient in using the power, using the that energy I from the battery. Believe yeah. there's there's an optimal output range. Correct. Probably. Yeah. And so, yeah, it'll be interesting because you know uh, intrigued me about the new rise because I feel like it's that full power full power SL, and this is kind of you an know what mountain. I think. Here's why I think it's not true. There's 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 the there's a pr- big problem with the variable of the human input here. Yep. But I think if it were true, you could go further on a charge on full power than you could on lower power. And I think the opposite is true. You can go further on a charge on lower power. Mm-hmm. And there is the big problem of it might just be because the human's doing more work on the lower charge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. But regardless, I think this is the second, this is the only the second bike in this category, full power SL. Yep. And People this, were unlocking their rises and making them like this mm, before. Right, right. Our, our buddy Dave did that. All right. Um, but yeah, this is the first, this is the second bike that comes from the factory with kind of an, a lightweight, smaller battery package and 85 new meters of torque. Yeah. The trans trans elite E is, May, is the archetypical yeah. version. Yeah. So that's interesting. The, you know, this, this rise is a, an interesting one to kind of slot in there with the, with the trans E elite, with the, with the heckler SL, with the pivot shuttle, AM SL. Kind the of Rise is the only bike on that list that's not mixed wheel. Yeah, that's interesting. And also the Norco Fluid VLT, I think, belongs on that list, and it's also a mixed wheel. Correct. But you could you could put the Rise in the high position and and mullet it. Did we talk about me riding the Norco Fluid VLT yet? No, I don't think so. I've ridden a lot of bikes. That wow. I, Was there yeah. a demo? I rode it with the Bosch guys. Oh, I see. And 
I rode the 130 version. Wow. Okay. And it, remember one day, I, I think I rode either our demo optic or your optic with you at Oaks. Yeah, yeah, I do remember and it, that. that day came, because it's, it's a Norco. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, about yeah, the same yeah. travel. Yeah. Um, that bike is rad. It really reminds me of an optic. I remember the thing about the optic that was a little weird for me is I felt like I was blowing through travel even i remember that yeah um that was not true on this bike at all i feel like the the leverage rate curves are more dialed mm, right um it was probably the most natural or it probably was the most kind of um playful poppy maneuverable e-bike i've ever ridden right. easily by kind of a lot it was really fun bike so what are remind me on the specs so 130 so it's probably like 130 140 or 130 130 140 130 140 uh, did you ride it with the 34 or 36 i think it had a 34 on it okay. or, or maybe a pike yeah that's oh the pike yeah that's cool uh i really like that fork um <clears throat> and then geometry on that it's, uh 65 something ish. like that ish yeah yeah um I think it's just slacker than that, if I remember correctly. Wow, yeah, and then it's got it's also got um, the the horse link, mm -hmm. the horse link, which is awesome. Uh, let's see, uh, motor. It's got the Bosch. Yeah, and that's the I always get the SX and the CX confused, but it's the new lightweight Bosch. Oh, motor. it's I think that's the SX. Yeah, and the thing with is it full power? It's fifty newton meters. Fifty newton meters. Whoa. So I was really comparing it to the Fazua system. Right, right. Um, in, the, in the plus side, it felt really powerful, and it felt fast, and it has a higher peak watt output mm, than Fazua yeah, does. Yeah, that's an interesting one, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it felt fast. At times, it felt faster than the Fazua. At times, it felt not as fast, but I felt feel like overall it felt comparable. Yep. But it was a little, it was surgier. The oh. power came on with more of a surge. Right. Um, I was a little bit surprised how much more I like the power kind of mapping on the physique. how the power comes on and off and on when the, it comes on and off and at what cadences. It just really. F oh, on the Bosch versus on the, the Fazua. On the Fazua. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I expected, I expected that to be closer and maybe even Bosch to win that in my mind yeah um but i was a little bit surprised that i came away with it like oh i really think that fazoo has got the software more dialed mm. on power control but did you was was that even in that emtb mode on the bosch yes oh interesting um to and it was good i liked it yeah. i liked all the modes i act, i still gravitated towards just full power even right, with the emtb right. mode option um, but on the EMTB mode, I often felt like at the kind of at like how I just ride, yeah, it was uh, it was like fluttering between high levels of support and lower levels oh, of I support, see. and kind I of see. surging on and off of higher that levels of support. Where on the Fazua, it's less; it's a more kind of linear on and off. I feel like, mm -hmm. or, 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 or gradual more and maybe right. where the power comes on and especially on the emtb because it's changing like the emtb i think is the only one that changes depending on what what you're doing how, mm -hmm. what you're inputting but on the fazua when you when you're in full boost mode it it's on but when it comes on the way it comes on is a yeah. I, I, I like how it comes on I, just you're right on a layer right that the emtb adapts in a way that the other yeah. modes don't right all the bikes do regulate power based on what the rider's doing but the emtb regulates the range of power output based right. on what the rider's doing sure more uh, that being said if you're on the Fazua, depending on what you're doing, you could be on full power. Or, and this is true of all, all the e-bikes, right? You can be on full power and it's not putting out full power because you're mm. not either not a high enough cadence or depending sure. on the bike, sure. not enough torque. Or, yeah, good point. Um, so, and I really feel like the Fazua has got a, maybe it's that it's got, the progression is more, a little bit more 
smooth. Mm. I feel like from one power level, sure. as it changes, it's a support levels. It's less jerky. Right. Right. Wow. So, so tell me more about your ride on the, on the fluid. The bike rips. I had an awesome time. I would, the motor is nice, is quiet. I think comparable to a Fazua. Yep. Yeah. Um, that bike's really light, really playful. Um, it is the least e-bike feeling e-bike I've ever ridden, I would say. Mm. And if you want that kind of like, it's the ultimate like oak split. It's like the transition smuggler or 5010 ride fantasy on an e-bike, right? Right, like, right. Like that playful short travel shreddy. Yeah, well, that's that's pretty fantastic. And it nails it. It nails that ride fantasy, right. I feel like. Right. With a horse link suspension, that's that's pretty fantastic. Yeah. Man, that's awesome. That is, that's exciting. That's exciting. Um, what else is going on? Um, so we were talking a little bit about, I got that click going on my Fazua motor. Yeah. Yeah. It took, you know, I checked all my pivots and I checked, you know, it kind of sounded, to, it, it's a clicking noise that I've heard similar clicking noises coming from like dust under a derailleur hanger mm. or a creek or like play in the rear hub or a creaky bottom bracket right or or a loose pivot bolt on the suspension so i'm like checking all this stuff and finally we narrowed it down to the motor oh no so i've been talking about how i think the fazo motor is pretty reliable and mine's getting warranted but uh, right you know that happens sure right and sure. i do think i i almost wish i had kept riding it to see like how much longer been. i could mm -hmm. go to failure right because it was pretty early and having issues i think like right. it was just clicking a little and making there was just a almost there was a very small amount of play and so, like on mm -hmm. i believe i think on the shimano eph there's an allowable amount of play but mm -hmm. the fazio is not there's there's if they're right there's no play right so i think you i think in the middle of one of our rides you you made a comment like that on when we were riding i thought you had said like huh what's that on your bike not on my bike Maybe the clicking the noise. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, our last ride by bike was clicking, and I was like trying to figure out what it was. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. So um, it was a very. It's just like a. It's the kind of noise that a lot of people's bikes make, mm. and a lot of people don't pay much attention to. It was a pretty quiet, like tick, tick, tick. Yeah, because okay, I remember it because you're like, "What's that?" And I was like, "It could be my bike creaking." Oh, I think at and one then, point someone was like, "Yeah," and then I think you're like, "No, I just think it's." I think it's on my bike. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, gosh, while we're on this, uh, man, anyways, um, I guess rip the whole bandaid off. The speed sensor on my, on my, on my relay is, is out. Yeah. Remember we were having, I was having that situation where the power is just cutting out. Yep. And there was no like error codes or anything like that. Power is just cutting out. And, um, it was almost felt like uh, if anyone's ever ridden an e-bike without the magnet, <laughs> right? Uh, how the power will come on and, and cut off and come on and cut off. So that that's what was happening. So I brought it into the shop. And again, it's just another, um, I was talking to Eric and he's got, you know, he's got an e-bike. He says, I've been through three different, he's had his for quite a while. And, and that's the Shimano motor. And that's the Shimano motor. We definitely see speed, sensors, speed sensors failing on all systems. So sometimes, yeah. It is what it is, and it was just a good reminder too. Because when I brought it in, well, I guess you can do your own firmware updates once you connect it to the app, which I don't have mine connected to my app, which is why Zach was like, "Oh, hey, you got a bunch of firmware updates that you can do." So, took care of that as well. It'll be interesting to see if you can feel the difference. I bet you can. Yeah, I mean, I've already liked it because I I already had the the firmware updated. Uh, probably I don't know, six months ago. Yeah. Um, so that, that was, that helped out a lot. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's good. A lot of good writing going on these days. Um, okay. I have a question for you. Yes. Making a pivot into a personal, personal, uh, habits. So when you lose a glove, like have you ever lost one glove out of, you know, out of a set? Do you keep the other glove? Like hoping it's like, you know, find my partner. You so, know? okay. Recently, 
I, I have a little bin of single gloves. <laughs> okay. So, yes. Yes, you do. And recently I found my old bin of single gloves. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You have two bins of single gloves. Apparently. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's like a family reunion. I have, I have <laughs> yet to get the two bins together and see if I can. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious okay so i had a recent experience where like my 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 single gloves of lost partners uh not just biking right gardening gloves mm. uh or work gloves and yeah. so and man the all leather work gloves like just the tan you know the, i love those the, the fantastic and but they're not cheap 20 bucks or something yeah they used to be like whatever you could find them for 10 bucks you know what have you so um well i lost i lost uh i lost one one of those and it's probably been two years and i've just had this one glove sitting in my in my glove bin i don't have a different like set of lost glove bins i just have one glove bin so it's been there. And then I also have a, a bike glove, you know, an Alpenstar cross country style, like that you just pull on. There's no strap, which I love this, right? Leather on the inside. It's got the little Terry on the thumb, like great design. Well, that was only one glove too. Well, I was cleaning out a bin and I came across a shoulder bag and that in that shoulder bag had two gloves. And they were the missing matches of both my work glove and my Alpen Stars nice. bike glove. I was so happy. So, anyways, <laughs> keep your keep your lost lost gloves reunited. Yeah, I have one more that I you know I my I, I have a Patagonia windproof really thin thin glove that I that I ride during cold weather use for riding during cold weather. And I'm pretty sure I, I'm keeping it, hoping beyond all hope because, but I'm pretty sure I lost that partner's not coming back. Bummer. Yeah. I have a sad glove. Uh, so anyways, yeah, lost gloves. Uh, what else is going A little on? more news. Sure. Um, Over the Hump is still going. Um, next one I think is early June. Holy Gym's closed June 10th to September 30th. I want to kind of get out there and ride it before June Ooh. 10th. Um, Is that because of a uh, nesting trail work? Oh, got it. Um, shop rides are going strong right now. It's a good time of year for shop rides. Yep. Go on our website, click on rides in the upper right hand corner to see more. Yep. I noticed you've got a whole bunch of um, laminated uh, shop ride uh, posters, uh, signs. Poster signs. Bikes and barbecue, June 9th. Ooh. This is kind of the updated version of Bikes and Beers. Right. Starts at the 649 B Shop and goes up through Peters and Oaks. Should be a good day. Sponsored by Smoked in 1886. Ooh, fantastic. So food and beer. Fantastic. Next over the hump is June 4th. Oh, got it. Um, yeah, speaking of events, large events, um, I was reading about sea otter. Attendance and exhibitors were up. I got. Th I was, I'm glad you let me know that. I didn't. I didn't have the data, but I had the kind of anecdotal and feel that that was true. Right. So, um, yeah. Supposedly, you know, thanks to Brain again, uh, exhibitors were up from 525 to 560 exhibitors, uh, and so that's that's good to see. Uh, all the campsites were sold out. Uh, for the four days, and that's like over nine, like almost 950 campsites. Awesome. Yeah. And then uh, I guess there was something like 77,000 visits, 77 attend 77,000 attendees over the four days. Oh my gosh. So, and talk about, so what made me think about it is Over the Hump has, has a really good turnout on the races, um, which is fantastic to see. And I was what I was, what I've also been doing is looking at the number of racers on, at the pro level at at some of these World Cup events, and I feel like there's less racers at some of these events hmm. uh, on the World Cup. Interesting. So I, I just thought that was interesting. But at Sea Otter, seventy six hundred racers. Isn't that crazy? Seventy six hundred racers. That's a, that's a lot. lot of people. Yeah, and that's four disciplines. I think so. Right. At least I think, probably. Yeah. 
And I suspect they, they're also including, I'm sure they have like kids races and they've got tandem races and things like that. So, um, but still 7,600, that's, that's pretty, pretty fantastic. Um, awesome. Yeah. So I, maybe one year I'll, I'll try to get out and go, go there. How, how long has it been since you've been? Have I've only we... been once and I think it was 2018. Wow. Yeah. You ever, think of, you ever think about going? Yeah. I think it's kind of be, become the trade show. Yeah. For sure. So for I sure I go sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were talking about uh, talking about my experience and bringing my bike, my relay in, and kind of the the flow through the workshop. Um, <clears throat> and I man, I was like, there's a great vibe here at 649B. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the staff and the customers are a little bit more comfortable, which overall leads to like a an, in, an increased reduction of tension. Mm, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, I think we managed to create a pretty comfortable and and um, happy shopping and working experience at the First Street location. But um, I think it's easier to do that here. Mm. What What are some of the things? And that's interesting too that this came up because it, I was talking to Drew the other day on a ride and he had mentioned how, you know, like sometimes when you go home from the bike shop, you're exhausted. It's like a lot of work. It's mm. a lot of focus and it's a lot of human interaction and it's a lot of mm. bike interaction. Yeah. And it's a kind of can be kind of an overwhelming amount of information to process. And right. Um, not to mention the, the human emotion that might get layered on top. Yeah, of that. for sure. So we're talking about that. And I kind of revealed that one of my kind of missions for the path is to find alignments where that is easier mm. that where that where it's where that that where, where it's more efficient to have to be that present to be that focused to help that many customers right and um i feel like the 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 more you set people up for like safety and success Got and, it. and everything Got so, it. just for example, if a tech and someone who's getting a customer's repair bike have to occupy, have to like <laughs> get out of each other's way a little bit for every single repair bike pickup, right? That's a friction point. Right. Right. So that adds to the cognitive load of the day. Yeah, for sure. And if someone happens to be, have a pre-existing condition of frustration coming into that friction oh, yeah. point, it adds to the friction, yeah. right? Like, yeah. so, and, and on and on, right? So I do think that that's what you're seeing a little bit mm. is just the continual kind of looking for these efficiencies where, and it's also about, um, you know, having an alignment of vision with the staff and the customers and the vendors to where people's expectations are getting met. Sure. And, and really can... the ultimate, the ultimate kind of shoot the moon goal is that like the, nothing ever, you, nothing could ever be perfect. But in my mind, the perfect bike shop work environment is one where every single bike that comes through and every single customer that comes through, we're genuinely happy to see them. <laughs> right. 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 At, it, it takes a lot of work to set up that kind of alignment and planning an organization yeah. and, and, and you have to stay true to the mission and all that. Right. But I do really believe that there's a, there's kind of a lot of efficiency that comes out of that. Right. If, if, if even if, if say the three customers and bikes that are maybe the most stressful to deal with that day, if the amount of stress that those causes lowered by 10%, that's a, like that's that a big increases win. your yeah. overall ability to do your job. Right. Like, do, and to do a better job more of the time. Right. right. Like, and then if the best, and then if say the, the better half or goes from being kind of mostly people, you're genuinely happy to see to all people. You're see right. what I mean? Right. Like, um, yeah. and by happy to see, I, I think that's maybe the wrong way to phrase it. Um, there's no, a lowering of cognitive dissonance and a right. lowering of adversi 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 adversarial adversity is yep. fine. Oh, this is a difficult problem. You've, you have, there's something wrong with your bike. You want your bike to work. Right. Um, this, that's difficult. Sure, this can sure. be difficult, but 
um, if it if it if it's a genuine cooperation where and with trust, right, and with um, it's a lot more efficient to get it sure. done. <laughs> like, and the way the shop is set up, like maybe without even explicitly knowing it, the customer here, 649B, you, you've optimized that, like that ease of gaining trust, the, 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 the transition to collaboration um, and, and working together towards getting your bike fixed. I think even people who don't identify as kind of emotionally sensitive or yeah. emotionally aware um, are. Right. So if I come out and the last four experiences I've had have been super frustrating for me and mm. anyone else around me. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you identify as kind of like only law, if you think you're Mr. Spock, right? <laughs> like you think you're Spock right. from Star Trek and right. have no emotions and only logic, right? Right. I come out and I, and I give you the same like friendly smile and greeting and everything. I'm convinced that you're going to have a different experience than if I didn't just have, I agree. Even if I, even if I do a perfect job of just being professional in both situations, I, I totally agree with you. I've, uh, I've told my staff, like I, I have a Rubik's cube at my, at my desk and it, you know, I'm a novice, novice, uh, uh, solver. And I tell my staff, like, man, you know, having the Rubik's cube here really helps me get centered. So when I've had those like, like events, I'll just go back to my cube. And when I get back, I'll just sit there and maybe solve, do a couple solves. And they're like, huh, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm recentering myself, <laughs> you know, so, awesome. so that when I interact with them, hopefully I've managed to put that, you know, hopefully they get the better, better part of me. Um, so, so anyways, no, I agree. And, and this is uh, the, sh the shop that you've done a You've done a good job, and it's not just you, but but everyone who's it's been a team, involved. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's good. Um, I think when I write my my big hit novel someday, my super villain's going to do your Rubik's cube thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be really scary when they do their Rubik's cube. Exactly. <laughs> oh, he's doing the Rubik's <laughs> cube. The harbinger <laughs> of uh, you know doom. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, this is uh, you know again. Uh, really, really enjoy where the shop is at. Um, so. I want to change gears a little bit because sure. there's something that's really on my mind. All right, you know how it. sometimes I get kind of like, like, lock jawed on like an idea, mm -hmm. or like, I kind I have a tendency to kind of focus on a concept and like wear it out. No, really? and um, <laughs> <laughs> lately I've been obsessed with ankle position and like whether or not you're dropping your heels oh, or pointing your toes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and just w w what those different positions mm -hmm. do and what they mean and yeah. when to do them. Sure, sure, sure. And it's kind of a lot. Like, so I've broken it. I mean, there's three main positions. Okay. There's both po toes pointed, heels up. Yep. There's both toes up, heels down. Yep, yep. And then there's one heel up, one heel down. Right. And often the and heel that's... all very important yeah. techniques. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes that... Yeah, for sure. Because so, that, like, so a lot of times that outside heel on a outside on a, on a cornering is down a little bit. Could be down a little bit, right? And that mm. may or may not be an aggressive position. To, to me, I think um, sometimes it's the back heel is down and the front heel is up. Um, yeah. and it creates kind of a wedge. Yeah. Like it creates pressure between the two pedals yeah. and helps you keep pedal pressure. Right. Um, so I've just been tripping out on like, what are all the situations where you would have <laughs> yeah. both toes pointed? What are all the situations where you'd have both heels dropped? Yep. And what are all the situations where one or the other? And like, what does it all do? Right. right exactly. exactly so i like this i think about this often uh i i oftentimes de defer to riding to letting other people lead on trails and i i watch their feet position foot positions heels and i in my mind's eye i i i'm like huh why are my feet doing that hmm. is it different than their feet and like yeah 
in certain moves even, right? Like this transition into like a hard, uh, like slapping into a berm or something like that, you know, like what, what, what do people, what are your heels doing? What are your feet doing there? And just, just as a illustration of all the different situations. Yeah. Part of what got me thinking about it is some of the trails we've been riding lately yeah. have these kind of moments where you come out of a turn into like a fairly steep, chunky straight section. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very much like a drop your heels and charge it situation. Right. Right. And I'm like, yeah, drop your heels. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. And it got me kind of thinking about it. Right. And so pointing the toes, like why point toes? Yeah. Right. Like when would you do that? And there's some, ob- some of the things that occurred to me are like, well, if you're landing to flat, you might want to extend everything so that you're, your ready to ex- absorb right it's like your springs are extended yep, totally right? totally Ext- your suspension is at full full t- travel waiting to take a hit yeah um you'll see like trials riders coming down from big drops to flat right with like their toes pointed and their feet yeah, yeah getting ready to absorb, ready yeah. to absorb so that's one reason why you might um anytime you want to absorb oh, it man. might be good I, to have your toes pointed in my mind's eye i see and it might actually change on a given feature into as you enter the feature as you're in the feature and as you're exiting the feature you're yeah and then another big thing that i've kind of realized later like i've been thinking about this for days and this this one hit me kind of later is that and a lot of this is just noticing what you're doing when you're riding and then like thinking about it yeah, yeah, yeah. and sometimes sidebar like sometimes that can take away from mm. the riding a little bit because yeah, yeah, you're yeah. like too I much agree. in your head. Yeah. Other times it can build into like a really solid foundation of, of kind of fundamental techniques. Sure. Sure. And it can, it's a little dance there, but that aside, I was noticing pointing the toes weights, the front wheel. So in a turn where I'm worried about mm. the front wheel washing out, pointing the toes can be good. Mm. And also pointing the toes unweights the rear wheel, which helps the rear wheel kind of drift a little bit. Right. So for that kind of very aggressive cornering where you almost hope the rear wheel slides out a little yeah. bit to keep the corner turning sure. and like where you're really leaning the bike over, um, I feel like I find myself pointing my pointing toes, toes. A more. Yeah. That's um, a really, I, I like that observation. And, and to the point where in like a safe, like, kind of medium traction zone if you just want to like practice drifting right you can play with that track that weighting and unweighting sure. of the rear tires simply mostly with your ankles right and and you'll feel your weight shift onto the bar and you'll feel the rear wheel start to come out yeah and it's all like it's a cool feeling yeah and you can go from full from full heels down into a flat corner shifting up to to move yourself forward just on the ankles yeah yeah i'm waiting the rear yeah um i was thinking about one thing that can be really dangerous is your two toes pointed and you and you hit a hard stop go over the bar it really weights the front wheel it could be too much right and and also um uh yeah there's some times where that you don't want to have too much of that bias right like it's a it's a big commitment correct Man, I've had certain times where, like, on uh, coming off of maybe a steep rock feature into, like, the transition to flat yeah. and what have you, I've had certain times sometimes where I feel like I didn't have my my ankles either correctly positioned or even, like, um, maybe not, not right prep for that landing. Mm-hmm. And maybe my heels were too far down in the in the section, and when you hit that bottom, it's like overextends, mm. you know. And so I feel like there's a particular feature that we've been riding that maybe at the top as you're entering, it might be it might be heels down or into in the middle of it, but with the G out at the bottom. There's a G out at the bottom. Yeah, I think what... There's a transition, right? Right. So at that G out, you want to unweight the front. Correct. Which a shift towards heels down at that moment, I think, is the thing, which means you need to leave some. Right. Some room to do that. Right. 
So not, so I think, it, but not going, so far that you're like, all of a sudden you're off the, you know, you, that GL causes you to off the back. Well, I think you want to do it before the GL. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah, totally. Um, to un- unweight the front. Right. Just a slight. So that goes to a thing of when you, when you're dropping your heels, it's, it lowers your center of gravity. Yep. It unweights the front wheel. So like if you're going through NAR chunk, it will reduce the likelihood that your front wheel gets hung up on something yeah. and you get like stopped and right. go, go flying. Right. Um, and it, it's part of the movement of unweighting the front wheel to pick the front wheel up is as you're doing it, you drop your heels. Yeah. Um, it's also what you do before you spring kind of the opposite of how you point your toes before you land, right. drop your heels before you, in order to load up at the springs. Yep. Yep. Ah, wow. Um, and then at different times, any one of those moves might increase connection to the pedals or decrease connection to the pedals. Right. Well, dropping the heels will almost never really decrease connection to yeah. the pedals, yeah. except that you might kind of be a little more of a passenger and a little less of a pilot. Right. Like it, it decreases your ability to move with the terrain. Right. Um, but maybe sometimes you're trying to make increase that connection with your pedals and dropping the heels is right. And one of the ankle positions we haven't talked about is feet flat. Yeah. Which is ready to do either one and also happens continually in the transition between the two. And it's kind of like the neutral. Right. Because that, and kind of evenly weights the wheels. Yeah. Because there might be a whole series of even through one rock garden or whatever, you are doing both. All, all th- maybe like even all three, maybe right? even like, four. You might do both toes pointed, both heels dropped, feet flat, and what some coaches call the pizza slice or the wedge where mm. one is up and one is down. Right, right, right. Yeah, to help yeah. increase the <laughs> to help increase the right. Increase and the and that wedge definitely helps create pedal pressure. Like yeah. you're pushing your legs kind of together. Right, right. And um also like you can get a little bit of a you can pick which pedal when you do the wedge, you can pick which pedal your weight bias is on, mm-hmm. and then you get the performance qualities of that foot position for that mm-hmm. moment. Yeah. So like like you want your you're in the wedge you want and maybe it might even just be a mild wedge right. it might not be like <laughs> right, exactly. a lot of these are more subtle than maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. exaggerated yeah although sometimes they're very exaggerated sure, also sure um but like you're in that wedge and you weight the front pedal more and you've got that that front point toe pointed rear wheel drifting committed to the front wheel vibe then right. you weight the rear wheel a little bit more move your weight back and you've got and your, your foot position is just kind of locked in and right to maybe help keep you from getting bounced off the pedals. Yep. But yeah, I think it's a very, the, the, I, I think that it's a very dynamic thing. Right. But kind of understanding the, uh, understanding the fringe cases like and understanding what things do. Right. Understand. And exactly. Understanding the fringe cases really help illustrate what, what, what is, what's happening, what, what, right. things, what it's doing. So that in these other cases where you're, all different positions. You're like, Oh, I understand why that's happening. Right. And I think different riders are different for me. I can do a move that I don't fully rational, that I can't fully rationally explain on the bike. Right. I I have enough kind of intuitive sense of how to ride a bike and just how I operate is like part intuitive, part logical. That's like how I work. Right. Um, but if I can talk myself through all of it, I feel like I can execute that intuitive riding with more confidence and more mm, sure. and less, m- less like my brain answering in like, you sure you know what, <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> what makes you think this is going right. to work out? Like, <laughs> or just think about this. And then you're like, you just thought about it. And you're like, blew the flow. You blew the, right. But like, if I can be like, no, like my body knows what it's doing. And this is, these are the, these are the fundamentals I'm just going to let that, I'm not going to be thinking about it while it's happening, yeah. but I can. And what are, one of the things it reminds me of is counter steering on a motorcycle, right? Like mm. anyone who rides a motorcycle knows how to counter steer. A lot of motorcycle riders, if they think too hard about steering, can't turn. Right. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I was that motorcycle rider until I like did this thing that I do where I walk into an idea on counter steering, right? Right. Um, right. And then I became someone who because I was someone who knew I could turn a dirt bike, I could turn a motorcycle, I could counter steer, but if I thought about it, it didn't work. Right. Because I didn't have a full logical understanding of it. Yeah. Um and now can, I can now I can execute that move either as a as like a thought command to my body <laughs> or as an intuitive reaction. Sure, Both sure, work. sure. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Because thinking through this really helps to set uh, the the practice. Right. Thinking through it deeply establishes the practice, and, and I that think becomes lowers cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, being, and for a, for a little bit, you might actually be a little bit more uncomfortable because you're thinking so hard and you're thinking so focused. But that you're going to come out on the other side much better with a lower low overall. Right, and I think distance. especially if you're that rider that already lives too much in your head, mm -hmm. too much of this might get you even more in your head for right. a while. Right, right. But I think like that's okay because you're going to come out better on the other side. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, no, that's good. Is that a podcast? I think it is. All right. Thanks, Auk. Thanks, Jake. Thanks to all the listeners who sit with us on our NPR like <laughs> rum <laughs> rant. <laughs> and thanks to everyone we work with here at the path and all the riders who support the path. And let's all remember to love the bike we ride.